And away we go. Cool. All right. So, like I said, this is number two of this thing. Um, you know, coming off of Thanksgiving, getting ready for a new week. I'm sure everyone's probably got a new uh, fitness goal after all of Thursdays, so I'm excited for this. So let's, uh, let's hit it on the first slide, Dad. Okay. Uh, so this is for you guys that don't know. Um, my uncle, and that was from this morning, and what he is is he runs uh, like a rehab program. He was a recovering uh, alcoholic and drug addict himself and joined the Marine Corps and has been clean and sober for like 35, 40 years at this point. Um, and this morning he got to actually go on CBS. Dad, what, what did they talk to him about? I was uh, not there for that, but what did, they, what did they hit on with him? Well, they had a whole show on recovery. And okay. so he's one of the main dudes in the country, in the world, really, travels the world talking about recovery. And he's a nuts and bolts, in-your-face, blue-collar, sailor-cussing uh, guy that gets to the point of a matter. Right. Well, that's true. Um, yeah, I thought this was kind of a cool first slide to start off on. Because, um, you know, if you ever talk to these people and stuff, like one of the hardest – things for them to do is, you know, get through day one of being sober. And then from then you got to deal with day two. And then, you know, next day, next thing you know is you get your 30-day chip and then 60-day, then 100-day, then you keep going. And next thing you know, you're five years sober and, and each year gets easier and easier. While at first you didn't know if you could make it to lunch without uh, drinking or shooting up or any of that kind of stuff. So I thought just kind of, you know, dialing it back because most of us, well, like most of our compound stuff is more, you know, um, health related or money or relationship but nobody really thinks you know how much of this compound effect idea goes into just recovery so to go from struggling to now it's just up oh, another year of being sober that's no big deal at all uh, I thought that was actually a pretty cool way to uh, just open this and use a different kind of example for this stuff so um, yeah so cool all right so let's get to the actual book and stuff Next one, yep. All right. So one of the things they talked about in the book was, um, you know, the, the title was, Do Elephants Bite? And the answer is no, but mosquitoes do. So do you guys know, first off, you probably know who that bottom guy is, but do you guys know who that top guy is, the top right guy? Just put it in the chat box if you do know who he is. Nope. Okay. So who he is, is he is Larry Craig. He was the Minnesota senator, and what he did was he was very anti-gay, anti, you know, not traditional marriage, and he got in trouble for soliciting uh, sex in a male bathroom at the airport. And the reason that Darren Hardy brought it up, why I brought it up, is because it's stuff like this. Yeah, see? Exactly, yeah, exactly, Laurie. So in his defense, you know, he was just trying to have a wide stance, I guess, to uh, get closer to that toilet bowl. But um, I guess when you put your hand under the stall, it doesn't really fly too well for an undercover cop. So the reason that we bring him up, we're bringing up Mel Gibson, is these guys are – those are, you know, Mel Gibson going on those rants is that's a big issue that that can ruin your career. You know, that'll, that'll blow everything that you had going for you, and that's like an elephant – uh, you know, does an elephant bite? No, but that's a big idea. But here, click it. Click the button again, Dad. Did you do it? There you go. So this stuff, the mosquito, this is the small little stuff that just kind of nags at you that that's what's kind of biting at you in your business or your life or your finances or anything like that where it's just this recurring little thing that it, it just seems like a, a minor annoyance, but it just keeps building and building and building. So like, you know, bills and stuff like that. If you start not paying all of these bills, you know, you're kind of SOL because like, you know, you skip one for the first little bit. It's not a big deal. But the more that you go, the more that they're going to add up, you know. And, I, and the way that I kind of look at this is with this gross profit margin, you know, maybe one time you, you go, okay, 
I really want this job. I know that it's cost thirty grand uh, for me to, to to do it, but I'm gonna charge him sixty grand. Okay, he doesn't want to do sixty grand. I can drop it down to fifty-five. But that five thousand dollars, you start rationalizing your mind like, okay, next time, what well, is for fifty-five? Maybe I can do fifty. So now you're on this negative compound effect where it just gets easier and easier and easier to not get, you know, not 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 to fulfill like your due diligence and stuff like that of, of making sure you make that certain amount of money. So with these small little things that might seem like a small annoyance or just a very um, not a big deal, they can actually add up more and more and more and more. So um, what I'd like to do is is Laura, you know, I'm going to call you up. I know you're pretty active with this stuff. Can you think of anything that you've done that was more of like uh, like a mosquito type deal where you had like a very small problem that you didn't really think was that big of a deal but after a, like a long period of time it started to like really add up and you know you kind of see where it is now. Yes, uh, our employee, one of our employees. What, what happened with that? It's just a little nitpicky things that he constantly does little things that bother me but I let them go ignored it, and they were always small, and then finally a pandemonium, the whole thing exploded. Uh, like what, what was he doing? Like what was a small little thing? Coming in late. Um, not, you know, forgetting something on a job site, forgetting something back at the office that he needed to bring to the job site, not keeping things as clean as he needed to, um, telling customers wrong information, selling them things that doesn't make sense. Right, and then, uh, then, then what happened at Pondo with this, this person? He finally decided that 11 o'clock at night um, on Saturday night during the party was a good time to confront me about every problem he's ever had and why he deserves a $23 an hour raise. I'm sorry, why he deserves to make $23 an hour. Right. Huh. And if I had dealt with it earlier, it wouldn't have all piled into one giant problem. Right. That's I know we had a guy like that where he was just kind of a crazy man, and he was cool. And then at Pondo, he just he was uh, he was turning 43, and his goal for his 43rd birthday at Pondemonium was to have 43 drinks throughout the day. And I think <laughs> I think at drink number 32, uh, he decided to get in my dad, which is his boss's face, and uh, confront him 35 beers later. So. Yeah, I see what that means. Um, yeah, that's crazy. Do do me a favor, guys. Drop in the uh, in the comment box if you can think of someone in your past that you've hired that has had these small little tendencies that you kind of let go, and after a while, it's just too much and it all blows up in your face. So go ahead and drop a a yes or something like that if you've had the same experience. So Lisa says yes. Dan, yes. Bill, yep. And and Bill, do me a favor. Can you share who you are? I don't think we've ever met. If you have a mic. Yeah, Bill. Hello, if you have a mic on you? Yeah, if you have a mic, Bill, just go ahead and speak. Okay. Oh, uh, no mic. Okay. All right. Well. All right. We'll keep going with it. All right, yeah, but I mean, so it sounds like everyone, uh, two guys this year that were in later and labor. Lee, do you have a mic on you that you could uh, kind of share this? So I think this this trend of people showing up late really starts to kind of add up over time and it just blows up. All right, nothing. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah, um, that's just, I think one of those common things that people always try to to rationalize that if this dude's doing great work and it's it's going well, but they're five minutes late. You know, if if they're like that in that capacity, then what's it going to be five years down the road when he starts to you know show up five minutes late to sales calls and starts doing bad stuff? Um, I know being in the military, like if you show up late to anything, you are in deep trouble. So I have I have this fear now when I go on like a first date, I am so paranoid to show up late that I actually show up about 20 minutes early. So I just like kind of twiddle my thumbs for 20 minutes trying to think of like my opening line um, but I make sure that I'm not late because I, I like that just kind of stands out to me so um, 
Cool. All right, Dad, you got anything for this one? I'm sure you could probably think of one or two uh, employees in the past that's kind of sucked and tell how it is now. All right, thanks. I don't look desperate. I look prepared, Mom. Thank you. <laughs> well, let me go back to this for a second, Logan. You All got right. a minute? Yeah, cool. So when I was in high school, I'm 59, so when I was uh, actually college and I would go home on Christmas break, I would paint with him. He had a painting company with my other two brothers, Peter and David. And at lunchtime, we would uh, go to like Pizza Hut. And they would start ordering pitchers of beer. All my brothers are alcoholics. And we would probably have, I don't know, four or five pitchers of beer at lunch at Pizza Hut at noon, you know, painting. We'd start at 7 o'clock in the morning. And I was drunk. Man, I'd get back in the truck. We'd go back to the job. I'd be asleep in the car. And they'd go back and fart around for like a half hour to an hour and then, and then go home and then start serious drinking. So this man here... Today's all about choices. He decided one day, and his story is amazing. He was in the military and actually threw him in jail. And he, it all came to light when he chewed the head off of a duck. He pulled a live duck out of a pond and chewed his head off in one of his blackout states. And he got arrested for that. And uh, he made the choice to every day get up and stop the crap. Just stop the crap every single day. And, you know, when I look at him, this is uh, he's been sober like 35, 36, 37 years now. And all my siblings have been for that long. Uh, it, it's amazing. But this compound effect that we're talking about, because he's look where he is today. He's on a national TV show living out his passion, talking about recovery. This man's done nothing but help thousands and thousands and thousands of people stay clean over the last 35 years. Hell, I got like 150 people like it. I just reposted. I took a picture and put a Facebook post on it. I got 150 likes, uh, which is way more than I normally get because he has followers of like 5,000 people all over the world that know this guy. So, so, you know, you want me to contribute something about choices? These people, him particularly, you got to get up every day and make a choice. And I don't care if it's recovery, business, relationship. You make these choices. You make the right ones over and over. You get really good shit. You make bad ones over and over, guess what happens? The opposite. These men here, they made huge, you know, one-time blunders, but we're not talking about that. We're talking about the, the little things, the mosquito, over and over and over. Every day, make the right move. Put your shit into QuickBooks. Ma make a cold call every single day. Every time you open your mouth, make 50% profit. These little choices compounded over 5, 10, 15, 20 years in business will add up to millions of dollars. Yeah, I mean, that's that's why uh, that's why weed is a, a gateway drug. I mean, think of that. Think of how, how tough it is the first time you smoke weed and you keep working up, and then eventually it's like, nah, you know what? It's just heroin. So, I mean, shit, everything kind of adds up. So... It's cool. All right, let's go to the next one, Dad. Cool. All right, so let me tell you my uh, my Thanksgiving. So this is this is half my Thanksgiving story. This is half me just being vain and showing you guys how much I like to work out. Because if I'm going to spend 250 bucks a month on a gym, you know, God damn it, you guys are going to hear about it. So um, my Thanksgiving I spent in Palm Springs with my roommate's parents. Now. My roommate's parents, what they do, talking, you know, let's think of like last week's discussion, which was all about how um, sometimes the work that you do, it's boring. It's not sexy. It's, it's tedious. Well, t speaking of boring, they own three storage units, self-storage units. And I'm just thinking like, oh, okay, neat. Didn't like, I couldn't imagine rolling up to like my high school reunion and telling people like, yeah, in 10 years, all I've done is... Uh, manage a, a storage unit. But these people, this was their Palm Springs house. This is, you know, Thursday morning of Thanksgiving. And this is their Palm Springs house. They also have a Cabo house. They have a Cape Cod house. I mean, they've got five houses from these most boring stuff. And I think what it is and what, um, what I found so awesome with it is that these people, 
that once you get your first house, like you, you know your first one that you buy, once you get your second house, the money just comes in that much faster. Then the third house comes, and the fourth house. Next thing you know, you've got plate, you got five different houses all over, all from this one store, you know, these these three storage units that you got. So I, I just like wanted to kind of share that like it's one of these things like this definitely opened my eyes that there's this a whole other side like world where these people just get richer and richer faster and faster and faster because once you kind of break through that mold so if you think of that Lincoln example from last week where it's like he's got nothing and nothing and nothing and nothing and nothing day 25 he's president and then by day 30 he dies as probably the greatest president and most famous one we've ever had I mean once you break into that threshold this stuff just adds up so much that it's just like it's mind blowing and I, I wish I would have done like a Facebook live from at their house because it was just like it's stuff that I would just see in movies. So you know, I it's just a whole new perspective for me, and I think it's it's you always hear that thing of uh, you are the average of your five best friends, and I, I constantly think about who my five best friends are, and you know, it's it's who you hang out with, and I think the more you hang out with better people, people in this book club who are giving up their Sunday night to try to make their Monday morning that much more motivating. I think is a pretty uh, a pretty great idea. So I just wanted to kind of share my Thanksgiving story and uh, just show that you know once you start to do this little stuff and once it adds up, it just you, you can't stop this snowball effect of becoming more and more successful in everything that you do. Hey, so, go ahead. Do your friends all work out? Uh, yeah, I I you know what I'm a very I used to be very uncomfortable. Was saying, you know, I'm shallow. I don't, uh, you know, I only really hang out with fit people. But then I kind of learned that it's not, you know, being being healthy and being physically in shape. It's not genes, or it's not a wanting to work out. It's actually, it's a discipline. It's a self confidence thing. You know, it's 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 everything who you are. You know, if you can convince yourself to wake up at five in the morning and go to the gym, because that's the only time that you can get up and go to the gym, you're the kind of person that I want to hang out with, because you're 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 motivated, you know. It's it's so much easier to do the the easy thing and turn that alarm off and wake up at seven. But those are the kind of people that I want to work. That I want to hang out with. So I would say all my friends are very physically fit. Um, the more that I get into this whole money idea, I get in pretty deep conversations. Um, like I drove from San Diego to San Francisco, and one of my friends decided to do the trip well with me, and we spent an hour on. Um, if you go, if you Google like investment calculator, it's just like we're just doing different scenarios of like, okay, well, what if your money made 7.5% over 30 years, and you you know you go from making a million to 1.2 million just because it's half percent. So it's just like I try to hang out with smarter and smarter people so that all the stuff that I'm doing it like encourages me to keep going. Um, so yes, yeah, so I guess that's a very long-winded way of saying yes. All my friends are are pretty uh, pretty fit. So that's just the the mindset of people that I like to hang out with. So, yeah. Um, all right. Cool. That's all. I just wanted to share that uh, Thanksgiving and, and show you what I'm working with. So, um, what this is is the author. One Thanksgiving, you know, how you go around the table and you say something that you're thankful for and that kind of stuff. The author, what he did was, he has a book. And every single day at the end of the book, he writes in there one thing that he was thankful for or appreciative of his wife. Every single day, 365 days. So the very next Thanksgiving when they went around, he showed her and gave her that book, and she immediately just busted out crying. You know, just cry. It was, it was, it was awesome. I think that one of these things is, is yes, you can take that into your uh, – into your personal life and do exactly like what he does because you know when you really start to focus on that kind of stuff, it really makes a big difference for people. Um, like for example, I know with me, my mother, uh, she came down one time. We were going out to dinner and she was wearing a nice dress and I didn't compliment her and she gave me so much shit for not giving her a compliment that now I just do it just you know just cause like you know you look nice, mom, and like you know she just says thank you. But I actually went out with one of my friends in San Diego. And I told her, I was like, oh, you know, your hair looks nice tonight. And five hours later, she brought it back up. She was like, I, you know, I'm not going to lie. I've been thinking about you complimenting my hair, and I can't believe you did that. So I think with what this guy did with his, uh, 
his wife was awesome. So what I'm thinking to you guys is, um, you know, someone other than Laura, what I want you to do is, um, Lee, do you have a mic? No, no, you don't. I already asked you. Lisa, do you have a mic, Lisa Oren? Lisa, any mic? Lisa or Ray? All right. Well, looks like you haven't, but do me a favor. Right, Lisa, you got one now? Lisa, you popped up. Yes, I have one now. Awesome. All right. So what I'd love out of you, if you wouldn't mind sharing in the spot, is can you think of someone in your company over the past week that they did something really awesome? You know, maybe they made sure that the job got done on time or they upsold something or they did something cool? Um, yeah, um, we had a service call um, that um, my business partner went out on and um, he was able to just easily, you know, upsell her the solution to the problem. So that was pretty awesome. So from there, so he upsold this, this solution from there, you know, did, did you compliment him? Did you tell him, good job, Jim, a bonus? Or, or how did you react to him doing this? Um, I think it was a, a, you know, a positive, awesome, you know, type uh -huh. of, uh, you know, great job that I relayed to him when he told me how things worked out. Right. And, and, and how, how does he take it from that when you go, you know, great job, you're the man, you sold this stuff. Um, like, like what, is his, what is his excitement level at that point? Oh, I think that increases it for sure. You know, it right. feels better about himself that you know someone acknowledged his efforts. Cool. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for sharing. Um, so do me a favor, everyone. Drop in there if if you if you can think of this week something that someone did. Let's let's do this. Let's say if you have somehow complimented your guys at least one compliment every day this past week. Drop a drop a Y in the Dropbox in the comp box. Dan said, yeah. All right. So, Dan, do me a favor, man. Do you, uh, can you share, give me, give me an example of yours. You know, what, what did someone do? How did you handle that? How did they respond to that? You got me, Logan? Yes, sir. Let's do it. All right. Um, I'm constantly complimenting my guys. Um, uh -huh. They're constantly blowing me away, uh, but I'm constantly hearing from our clients. We started a job this past week and within two hours into the job I come back on on site and the homeowner catches up with me and just just starts you know let me know how impressed she is with you know how much work they've gotten done, how nice they are, how clean they are you know right off the bat we've only been into this for, for two hours so Usually, usually when I show up on the job site, I have something nice to say about what they did the day before, or if I show up at the end, it's what they've got done that day. Um, I might bring up stuff maybe I'm not happy with, but it always ends in a compliment. So how, how do you approach that? Because I know I've I've been taught like the the sandwich method where you lead with a compliment, you give them the critique, and you end with the compliment. Is that kind of how you do it too? It's kind of the same, but I, I honestly don't think about it. Um, uh -huh. You know, it doesn't necessarily have to start with a compliment, but um, in my just my belief system, it should always end on a positive, um, always. Right. So it, it may get sandwiched in there. Um, I really don't pay attention to it. I understand that concept, but yeah. I think it's just more you know ending on a positive, um, even if you have some criticism for somebody. I mean. You know, straight criticism usually is a, is a negative. Um, so you try to try to spin it at the end, whether it's a positive criticism or just end on what they did do well. Right. Awesome. Yeah. I mean that uh that that lasting effect. I know. You know, being a diver, it was um when you go in the water, the very last thing that the judges can see is you pointing your toes. So if you do everything great and you don't end on a great toe point, you know that toe point could get you two points extra each judge, which over the course of, you know, a meet, that's going to get you an extra 50 points, which is the difference between eighth place and second place. So, sure. uh, yeah, I mean, that's cool. That's a, that's a cool little lasting effect. Thanks. Yep. Um, 
one of the things I know that my dad taught me was um, I, had to, I had to like do something for him, and I really did a, I did a real half-ass cleanup job, and it I had to go back out there, and he made me redo it because he always talks about how you know there's some people that go out there and they do the job, they tear up your yard, they do this, they do that, and his whole thing is that you will never know that I'm ever been there because that lasting effect is such a big difference that if you leave someone's yard nice and clean, well now they're gonna start referring you to their friends, and then their friends are gonna start using you, and then they're gonna refer you to your friends, and then your money just grows and grows and grows and grows, all because you decided to power wash off that driveway on the way out. So, yeah, I think that's a uh, that's a pretty cool lasting thing. Um, all right, cool, Dad. Let's go to the next one. Okay. Do you guys? There's probably, probably half of you guys know who this is. This is Tom Smith. Now, Tom is a pond water feature landscape guy up in, I want to say Jersey. It's either Jersey or, or New York. Dad, do you know where he is? Yeah, it's Coy, uh, Coy State. I think he is New, Jer New Jersey. Yes. Yeah. So, uh, New York. All right, Lisa says New York. Okay. So, what Tom did was he is a he's a uh, pretty successful, um, uh, you know, CAC certified state contractor. He's done very well in business, but he came to the CSA summit, which is the conference that's at uh, you know my house in um, in Maryland. And one of his goals was to lose weight. So what I'm very good at myself is I can be a pain in your ass if you're trying to lose weight. So I was talking with him pretty much on an every single day basis about what he was doing, how he was eating, how he was working out, that kind of stuff. And one of the things that I said to him that I didn't think was that big of a deal, but it stuck with him was, Tom, if you want to be a 200-pound man, you have to think and act like that 200-pound man. You know, everything that you do, it, it's, it's like dress for the job that you want, not the job that you have. So that's what that's exactly what Tom did. He started tracking everything, making sure everything uh, was doing that he was doing was exactly how a 200 pound man would do. So, uh, click the button. Yeah, can you hit it? I, it's done, Logan. Okay, cool. Yeah. Um, so this is Tom. Six months later, 40 pounds down, and I mean, you can just see the difference in his confidence, how he looks. I mean, he, he's, he's killing it, and he and I still talk about how big of a deal that weight loss thing is, and it's just like you just have to act like that, that mindset of, of whoever you want to be. If you want to be a better husband or a better wife, you know, start acting like that person that you really want to be. Um, one of the things that helps with weight loss, I know that my dad did, was he has a calendar. And every single day, he would write down his exact calorie count. So he knew, if you go straight up by the math, he knew by the end of the week exactly how much weight he should have lost. And dad, by your math, how, how closely accurate was it between the amount of calories you should have lost, I'm sorry, the amount of pounds you should have lost versus how many you actually lost when you tracked it? It's exactly that. The math adds up. You know, it's calories in, calories out, and it all works. Right, exactly. So that's one of the things that Darren Hardy talks about is when people are trying to do something very specific, if you track everything, you, you can't go, you, there's only like yourself to blame because you have all the stats right there. You have all the reason why something might not be working or something is working right there. So I know with, with me, you know, weight might not be the issue, but for me, I was trying to create a budget because I was spending a lot, had no idea where this stuff was going, and my mom said, Logan, go back through your credit card statement of the past week and just write every single thing down. So I started writing stuff down, and I didn't quite realize that, like, you know, that $3 smoothie is adding up. I mean, you have that five times a week, that's 15 bucks right there. I mean, that stuff starts to add. So one of the things that... Darren Hardy said was, go out, buy a little notebook, and just whatever goal you're trying to get to, start writing all that stuff down. Write down every single little thing that has to deal with that. Um, 
You know, so whether you're trying to lose weight or you're trying to save more money or you're trying to uh, watch less TV, you know, write down every single little thing that affects your decision of getting better or getting worse every single minute of the day. So what I'd like for you guys to do right now is drop in the comment box, write something that you know this week that you're working towards that you know that you can track. So whether it's weight, finances, relationship stuff, religious stuff, do me a favor, drop it. So Dan says uh, spending. Dan, do you have a mic? Can you hear yeah, me? There? Yeah, man. Cool, so, I got you. Yeah, I, uh, Go I you know, track my business spending pretty well, but I don't do very well in my personal spending. So I just opened up a QuickBooks file on my personal spending to track what the heck I'm, you know, where all my money's going on that end. So with this, what you could do is you could, when you roll around with this notebook in your in your pocket, let's say like you get up like, you know, let's go through your day real quick. Do you get up, go grab coffee somewhere, or are you doing all that stuff at home? No, nah, I used to, but yeah, I, uh, I cut out a lot of that stuff. Okay, what about eating out? Do you do lunch and dinner out, or is that also you cooking? It's all all coming in home now. Just just recently too. It's it's right. all coming in. Right. And what finally got you to go? You know what? My spending is just too much. Well, it's it just didn't seem like it was too much at first, but I mean, it totally resonated. He's like, hey, that five dollar coffee, even a couple times a week, you know, that adds up to you know this amount per year. And you know, if you invested that money instead of you know put it towards Starbucks or whatever, I mean, you could really see some good returns off that. So, yeah, I'm being a, a tight ass and, and um, just cleaning up a lot of my habits. And, you know, if it's if it makes sense just to, you know, make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich for lunch and, you know, eat three meals a day at home versus going out a couple times, uh, you know, I've, I've definitely noticed, um, you know, a little bit of a difference in my bank account just couple hundred bucks, you know, left at the end of the week that, you know, was normally like, hey, you know, I normally kind of, you know, this wasn't here normally. Right. Cool. So what do you, what do you do with that extra few hundred bucks? I'm putting it in savings. Yeah. Are you investing it or are you just leaving it in like this savings? Yeah. Like that? Yeah, I've got a kind of a winter time pad, but um, I'm definitely putting money away for investing too. Yeah. Yeah, it's funny how that, that $5 coffee, I think he says in the book, he says, every dollar you spend in 20 years is worth $10. I think that was the number he gave, wow. and it was just all that stuff. So that, that $5 coffee that you're skipping out on right now, you know, by the time you retire, that's just 50 bucks right there that you just added to your, to your money. So uh, cool. All right. I'm good with that one, Dad. What do you got for this tracking thing? Tell, actually, do this. Tell us about your calorie story because Lee Frisbee is trying to lose 32 pounds by March 31st, which that gives him eight pounds a week, or I'm sorry, eight pounds a month, two pounds a week, which is about 6,000 calorie deficit per week. So, in your experience, Dad, how does tracking this help? You know, like to to know that 6,000 calorie deficit that you got to hit it. Well, first of all, you have to write everything down. You can't you can't lie to yourself. You can't eat anything. You can't go to a restaurant and eat anything that you don't know what's in it. So it all starts with you eating at home or reading labels at the grocery store and making sure that you whatever you put in your body, you have a realistic count of what's going on. And I write it down. I write down breakfast, lunch, dinner, snacks, drinking, whatever it is, how many calories in. And then calories out, I have a Fitbit, and Fitbit tells me every day based on you know my exercise and my steps and my weight and my height how many calories out, and I track it every single day, um, and it tells me you know if I'm running a, a surplus or a deficit. And my goal was to have a thousand calorie deficit every single day. That means I can go eat 2,500 calories. I just got to burn up 3,500. And you know what? It's not that hard to do. In my case, I'm doing it by hiking in the woods, and it's about a two-hour commitment. So you got to like 
if you're going to do hiking, it's a two-hour commitment. If you're going to run, you could probably do it in about an hour. But the point is, don't lie. Be honest. Write everything down. Like Dan wants to get a hold of spending. You know what, Dan? If you pull out a, a pad and you write down and have to write down every freaking thing you spend money on, you're going to start not spending money on stuff because you don't want to pull out and embarrass yourself and write it down. Same with food. You know, if you just want to stop by, I got a Rita's on the way home, and that kills me. Rita's is like, you know, 350 calories for a regular cone. And it's just so easy to whip in and whip out. If I whip in, I got to write it down. If I don't whip in, I don't have to write it down. And it's true. And at the end of every single week, I weigh myself. I weigh only once a week. Now, I only do this when I'm being good. At the moment, I'm not being good. But every week, I write down. I add up all the calories. I divide it by 3,500 because that's how many calories is in a pound. And sure enough, within a half a pound, it's accurate. Whatever the scale says is exactly what my math said. That's how it done. So, Lee, if you want to you wanna really lose weight, you know, Who's that? Jillian Michaels. She, she, you know, she's that stud trainer. And she would always get, you know, questions from uh, people that go, oh, I eat salads all day and I'm not losing weight. And she's like, that's bullshit because you're not really adding up what you're eating. A Caesar salad, for instance, you know, might be 400 calories at one restaurant, 1600 calories at another restaurant. You know, it all depends on what's in there. So if you, you know what you're eating and you track it down, Math is math. It doesn't lie. And that's how I do it. So, Lee, with that being said, it sounds like you got a uh, – next next book club with you, you might have to be uh, get on a mic for that one because we want to hear uh, hear how you're dealing with the tracking of that stuff because that's really the way to do it. You know, it's math. So, cool. All right, let's go to the next thing, Dad. All right. So – <laughs> Dan, I, I've had the same issue, man, where I try to put on so much weight, and it's gotten to the point where I, I, I just can't do it, you know, I'm just going to like, I've just tried sitting there for an hour and just to finish all my food, and I, I still can't gain weight, so I'm, I'm there with you, man. Um, all right, so in this story, Darren Hardy, back in the day, was uh, in real estate, and he went to his accountant when he was young, you know, I think he was like my age, like 25, 27, something like that. He went to his accountant and said, and the accountant said, "Look, you owe a hundred thousand dollars in back taxes." And he goes, "Well, it's like I don't, I don't have that money. You know, I don't know why you expect to have to have a hundred thousand dollars in cash." So then, the accountant pretty said, "Look, dude, you got to chill out. You got to get a hold of yourself because not only do you have to pay back this money, you have to now make enough money to pay that back, plus pay taxes on the money that you're making to pay this back." So just adds up, 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 more and more and more. As soon as you start not paying that first thing, it just builds and builds and builds and builds. So do me a favor, drop in the comment box, has anybody ever like been stuck having to pay back taxes? I don't know how common of a thing this is. I'm 25 and I've always like, you know, been okay with my stuff, but like, is this that common? All right, so Dan says a few years ago. Other Dan says, no. Dan stands it took him five years to pay back back taxes. And that's one of those things, Alan's going to know, Dan, can you do me a favor, can you hop back on and, and uh, I want to hear about this because I'm actually curious myself to see how that works. I mean, what at that point, what is your mindset for five years where you're just like having to chug away just to get back to, to you know, square one? Yeah, it sucked. And, you know, the first, I'd say three years in business were just really, you know, kind of no planning, flying by the seat of my pants, and just barely scraping by. So that made it really difficult because I I didn't have a lot of extra income, disposable income, just to even shell out a couple thousand dollars to the IRS. Um, but yeah, I mean, you just kind of have to chip away at it as you go. And um, yeah, now it's to the point where I just pay them quarterly, and you know, hopefully there's not too much at the end. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I can't imagine. It's like all the money that you know that you want to go out and you want to go get a couple of drinks out at dinner and stuff, that should be going back to the IRS. That's it's probably just like constantly looming over you. Yeah, so. yeah it took me from 2010 to 2015 was really when, well, at the beginning of 2015 was when I was caught up. So almost 10, or almost five years. Yeah. 
Yeah, like I, I know with uh, like with credit card bills and stuff like that, it's the same deal where you start paying those credit card bills and all you're doing is you're just paying off the interest. You're not even paying off the principal. So you're just constantly throwing away money, but you're actually not getting anywhere. And if anything, a lot of times you get worse. So, you know, a lot of stuff, it's just, it's just so much easier to dig yourself into a hole than it is to dig yourself out of a hole. And this stuff is just a lot of times a lack of tracking. You know, he just didn't pay his taxes because he didn't do his due diligence and his back work to make sure that he was getting this stuff done. And then at the age of 27, I, I couldn't imagine walking in to my account and they go, okay, dude, you owe us 100 grand. I mean, I, I, yeah, that's crazy to me. So just with a lot of this stuff, I mean, this, this snowball effect is very real. And as soon as you start slipping back, you know, once you are on this diet and you start, okay, well, it's Sunday, I'm going to have a, uh, I'm going to have a cheeseburger. Well, then Wednesday comes around and you have another one. And then the next week, it's, it's Sunday, Monday, and Wednesday. And then little by little, you're back, you gained all that weight back and you're, you know, where you originally started just as unhappy, if not even more unhappy because you had it and you lost it. It's like in, in school when you got an 89% and you got a B, but that's not a B, that's more of you missing out on an A minus. So it's, it's just so much easier to just start off on the right foot. That's why we do these things on Sunday nights so that way on Monday you get up, you hit the ground running, you're ready to go, and you don't have to wait until Tuesday or Wednesday to get back on on track after you hear like a CSA webinar or anything else. So, Dad, have you ever had to pay back taxes? Nope, never did. But my brother did. You know, the guy at the top of the show here, um, uh -huh. right there. That man, I guess, thirty years ago, I had I he owed thirty thousand dollars, and that thirty thousand that's about a hundred grand a day thirty years ago. Um, so he got himself in a, in a mess, and we got him out of it. So. Because he was so focused on what he was doing, he wasn't the money. He's an artist. This guy's an artist. You know, he's a starving artist. He's not starving anymore, but that's how he was. He just was focused on doing one thing, helping people. He didn't focus on the money part of it. And guess what? The IRS focuses on the money part of it. I, I put in a chat box that I had a friend of mine in, in the swimming pool business. Now, Jeremy, I used to also be in the swimming pool business, the lifeguard business up in Maryland, and a buddy of mine who was also in a lifeguard business he got his business padlocked he decided it wasn't important to pay employee uh payroll tax and after five years of that the irs put padlocked him and it took him like 10 years to get his ass out of trouble so um nope i never i'm one of these crazy people that that love to pay a lot of taxes because it only means one thing what does it mean Put in the chat box. What does it mean when you have to pay a lot of taxes? Come on, folks. We got 16 out of them. That's right. You make a lot of money. I mean, that's a good problem to have. If that's your biggest problem, you're paying a lot of taxes, you got a good life, right? I think so. Uh, I just saw – so my mom works in the uh, – She's a mortgage lender, so she pulls credit. She knows all that stuff. She said that the average family pays $6,648 in interest every single year. So that's $6,648 that they're actually missing out on. All right, so you take that over a 30-year period. So instead of paying that, let's say you take that money and you invest it, over 30 years, you're missing out on $615,000 that you could have. But instead, you got nothing. So... That's just how this little snowball stuff works. You know, it's just you start slipping back and you really slip back. But um, all right, so one of the things that we all know, slow and steady wins the race every single time. You know, it's, it's so easy to, to – this is why those New Year's resolutions end January 3rd because people would start off so much and, you know, it would be like if Lee Frisbee said, I want to lose uh, 32, 32 pounds in four months, but his goal was, okay, I want to lose five pounds this first week. You know, it's just you lose interest so fast and you lose all this momentum because you try to just be a catalyst for yourself and do this crazy stuff. So, you know, let's do this. Do me a favor. Drop in the Dropbox if you've ever gone on a diet and you just end up yo-yoing for the entire period of you being on that diet where, you, you know, you're going up, you're going down. It's not consistent. 
Yep, Lee's, yep, Dan, yep. Yeah, you know, yeah, that 25 years. I mean, you know, I've, I've, yeah, every, everyone does it. Everyone does it with finances. They start to get really complacent and think, okay, I've been doing really well. Let me, uh, let me start slipping back, and it just starts to um, screw up. I mean, Dad, I think I've, I've seen you go from 185 to 220, back to 185, back up to 210. I mean, what, what is, what is the mindset for you? Why, why do you go from 190 back into 210 in in six months. Well, um, geez, there's a lot of emotions that go into it, Logan. I feel like, you know, when I'm when I lose the weight, I feel great about myself. I feel like a total winner. When I when I gain all that weight back, I feel like a loser. So those are the emotions that that get played into it. But I get, you know, lazy and cocky and. I go, you know, I could have this one, this and one, that and one before I know it, uh, you know, you know how this stuff works before you know it. I mean, you don't Logan, but you know what? Everybody else listening to me knows how it works. Six months later, jeezy peasy, that weight comes right back on. So you just, you know, you just, you know, like dad said, it's, it's like, it's a, and it's an addiction itself. The good life is an addiction. One of the problems right. you make when you start having a success in your business and, and like money's not the issue anymore for you, and you can do and eat and go out and all this stuff. It's the greatest. You know me. I'm social. I love this stuff, but Christ, it comes with calories. Yeah, I listened to an NF CEO the other day, and he was saying that food is probably the hardest uh, addiction to give up, and it's because you still got to do it. You know, if if you were addicted to, uh, you know, alcohol. And then they said, okay, you don't have to do hard liquor, but you still got to at least drink beer. You know, that, that still feeds that addiction. So it, it's, it's a hard thing to, to get under control just because you think you have it under control and you're good, and then you realize that you, just, you don't. So with a lot of the stuff, I mean, you just – you got to just little by little chip away at it. Uh, I know Lisa Oren, she posted in the, uh, in the group, it was, it was her weight. You know, and one of the things I think was awesome – um, she said, nothing huge, just increasing step counts weekly and being conscious about eating choices. So she didn't decide to jump on day one and run a, a marathon and lose five pounds because of just sweating it all out. She does every single week. She just increases a few more, you know, her step count, and that's what does it for her. So let's say, like, you know, Dan Stanza with, uh, with his saving. I mean, day one, I don't think he was quitting cold turkey, spending everything, I'm sure – Little by little, you start to pick little things that you might not necessarily need in your life. Maybe you don't need that Starbucks coffee every day. Then, then you go, okay, I don't need the Starbucks coffee, and maybe I'll, I'll bring uh, my own food to work on Wednesdays. And then the next thing you know it, you're not even drinking coffee. You're, you're bringing all your food to work. You're saving all this money, and it's just a slow, methodical, tedious grind day in and day out. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's it's – it's not fun. It's kind of boring. I know I tried a diet one time called paleo, and that you cut out pretty much all carbs. And it took me a week to work into it, where for two days I cut out dairy, then the next three days I cut out uh, bread and pasta, then the last two days I had to cut out rice. And it was just acclimating my body into it. So by the end of it, it was super easy to to not have carbs, but it was uh you know I didn't realize how much sugar is in bread or in pasta or in rice. And as I cut out more and more and more it kind of softened the blow a little bit. So I was, uh, I was definitely in a slow, methodical um, path to trying to go, you know, carb-free, which maybe that's why I can't put on weight. I don't know. So, all right, hit the next one, Dad. Oh, there it is. I'm sorry. So there's Lisa, Lisa Oren's, um, yeah, you can say that. There's her thing. You know, it's just she, she's tracking. She's increasing her step count. So from just right there, I mean, that's, that's math. Everyone sees it. She puts it out there, so we all know how she's doing, and it's it's awesome. I mean, Lisa, good job. Keep it up, and uh, you know, I don't want to put you on the spot, but I am. So each each time we have one of these, I'm going to go back check it. I'm going to put it in this uh, on this slide, so everyone here can uh, you know see how you're doing, see how that how that step count's going. So all good, Lisa. All right, go to the next one. All right, cool. This is one of the um, this is one of the coolest things I think in the book that I've read so far, and I, I love it. And it's all about starting 
early with all this stuff. This this snowball effect, you know, what this example is is at uh, from the ages of 23 to 40, your friend puts in $250 a month in a savings account that has an 8% return. All right, at the, after the age of 40, he stops. At age of 67, when your Social Security kicks in, you've got over a million dollars saved up, and you've only uh, invested 54 grand. But you, on the other hand, maybe you go travel the world, you have fun, you live your life, and then by the age of 41, you go, you know what? I kind of need to, uh, kind of need to start saving for retirement. And you start at 41, and you go all the way through 67. You've put in 81 grand, so you have more money, you know, a third of it more money in there, and you've only made $285,000. And it's all just because you waited long enough. So this is the idea of, of, you know, maybe you have this money in there, and it's not doing that much, not doing that much. So you take it out because you want to buy that new car because all it's done in five years is, you know, make $1,000. You take it out, and you're back to zero, and now you go from a million dollars at 67, and now you're at 285, all because you wanted that one car at the age of 40, and you took it all out and had to start over. So I like, you know, my buddy that I drove up to San Diego with, uh, I'm sorry, San Francisco with. This is like what we talked about, and it was okay. Can you know I'm at the age of 25 right now. What if I would have saved this much starting at the age of 21? And it's just unreal how much it really just starts to to, to add up. So I mean. With this stuff, do me a favor. Drop, drop in the box if you have kids. If you have, you know, children of your own, do that. And drop in the box for me uh, with a yes. So Laura's got two yes. Yep, yep. So this is probably make you a uh, not super popular parent, but uh, I mean, <laughs> thanks, Dad. Um, but if you start putting, you know, a little bit of money away when they're the age of five and the age of eight in their account, you know, maybe every birthday instead of you giving them a hundred dollar present, what if you give them like a fifty dollar present and invest that fifty bucks? And then over from the age of five to sixty seven, over sixty two years, I mean, think of how much that's gonna be worth then versus this toy that they're gonna break in two months time. So I mean with all this stuff, I mean the more open you are with your kids about all this finance stuff and how much all this all these ideas, maybe just not just finances but when they're six and they're seven and they're not wanting to do the homework, the difference between not doing your homework at the age of six and seven, what that snowballs into, okay, how do you do in high school? Do you get into college? Do you get a good job? And it all starts when you're super young. Um, one of the coolest examples that I ever thought about was uh, I read it in this book called Outliers, and the whole thing was about how all the NHL players, the best hockey players in the nation, are all born in January, February, and March. And the reason for that is because when you play, let's say, an eight, you know, ten and under league, okay? When you're ten years old and you're born in January, versus under, you know, ten years old when you're born in December, the January people have eleven months more of of being mature and grown up than you are. So they're going to be taller, stronger, bigger, faster. So they're naturally going to get picked up for better things. They're the ones that are getting picked up for the the A team versus the people born in. Um, you know, May through July picked up for the B team, and then October through December is picked up for the C team. The A team gets that much better uh, training and coaching and, you know, everything and equipment, while the C team doesn't get nearly that stuff, and it just adds and adds and adds and adds, and then eventually, um, you know, you have the entire league is born in the first three months of the year. Uh, so my mom said, allowance, we made our kids split their gifts to their friends when they were little, made them much more thoughtful and frugal when it was their own money. Yeah, exactly. So it's just the, the little things that you get taught as a kid can actually add up to so much, um, you know, as you get older. So uh, cool. As, I like this example a lot. All right, so one last final slide before we're done in three minutes. This is the difference between um, – oh, my screen just popped away. I don't know what happened. Um, this is the difference between having – a coffee every day versus not having coffee every day. I did 10 grand, 7%, everything else is the same, but one is you giving up a little bit. So just like what Dan was saying, I mean, just one little minute thing, and it makes such a big difference. So do me a favor, drop in the comment box one little thing that you know you can give up 
this week that might not be that big of a deal, but it's going to be such a large deal, you know. Um, whether you know maybe it's it's soda or uh, for 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 weight or for coffee for uh, spending money or maybe ten minutes of TV each night to give up for a better relationship. So do me a favor and drop down there something that you know this week that you can commit to to giving up. All right, so Lisa candy bars, breakfast wrap and Dunkin' Donuts. Boaz is eating out, which is actually that's a pretty big one that'll help out a lot. Okay, all right. Al, Alan's probably got the easiest one, so I, I like that. Yeah, less Facebook, more education. You know, so it's 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 this stuff. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna save this, and um, you know, just to wrap up, next week I'm actually flying to uh, to the East Coast, so I'll be in the air. So we're not gonna meet next week, but the week after, in two weeks. I'm going to hold you guys to it. You know, I'm going to look at this stuff and save this and go, okay, you guys, how did you do? Lisa, did you give up those breakfast wraps and Dunkin'? You know, what's going on with that stuff? So I'm going to actually go through, call you guys out. So, you know, if you have a mic, make sure you, you know, do it. Otherwise, I'm going to have you drop it in, a, uh, in the box, and we're going to test it and see how everyone's doing. So with that, I mean, that's the end of, uh, end of the second session, end of Chapter 2. Um, Dad, you got anything on uh, some parting words for the week? Maybe a little bit of a pump-up speech? <laughs> well, I mean, today is all about choices. And, you know, it's, it's like, well, stay with the diet thing. We all know without being a genius, what before we put something in our mouth, is it a good thing or is it a bad thing? I mean, we inherently know this stuff. So that's with everything. So just get up every day, make the right choices. We have an expression called wake up and grind. You just got to do the hard work. You got to do the crap nobody else wants to do. And if you continue to do that stuff, no matter what you're shooting for, more money, you know, more health, better relationship, whatever it is, if you put it into time and effort, you will reap the rewards over time. And that's what the compound effect is all about. Yeah, I'll give that one. So, all right, two weeks from today, same time, same place, not next week. So make sure. Uh, after that, we're going through Chapter 3, and all the stuff that you have in your mind, you know, put that down, write it down, go out, buy that little book that you write down, every little thing that you work towards, so that, that way in two weeks you don't come here, you know, with your tail between your legs all upset that you didn't get it done. So have a great two weeks. Um, good luck with everything, and uh, I'll see you guys later. All right. Thank you.